We're also currently recording and ready to start. I pass the floor to Ambado Suazo to launch uh, this event. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all, in particular our colleagues from uh, Longi and uh, Gorla Foundation of Performing Arts. Uh, from New York office uh, is uh, um, an honor once again to come together to uh, talk, to exchange views, to share knowledge about the importance of uh, performing arts, um, classic music uh, on the area of uh, sustainability. Um, we were just coming out of this uh, uh, pandemic situation and we were seeing the light of the tunnel. Um, many people lost their lives, many sectors of our uh, society suffer. Uh, performing arts um, suffer a lot in every aspect of their uh, areas of work, colleges, uh, students, uh, concert halls, um, performers, uh, and support staff in every single part of those uh, elements uh, lost their jobs or were forced to early retirement. And so we were uh, very happy when we were able to come together and to start to uh, launch new initiatives in order to enhance the possibility to see it performing arts uh, uh, again at the uh, level that it deserves in the international community, in the society, has a healing uh, factor uh, uh, for our uh, humanity. Uh, still, uh, I always uh, says that uh, uh, performing arts is embedded in our genetic code, and, and there is no human being that cannot relate it to music, to perform, to uh, poetry, uh, to uh, play in music. And so, uh, so important for the United Nations uh, as a whole, and in particular for, for, for UNITA, has a training and capacity building institute. I would like to share your, the history actually of uh, uh, classic music in the United Nations since the beginning. And it's always been associated on the issue of uh, disaster risk reduction or raising funds for uh, humanitarian causes since the uh, uh, inception of the United Nations in 1945, concerts became in the General Assembly Hall uh, to be held in order to do that. And, and there is a long story of that. So performing arts, classical music is embedded also in the genetic of the United Nations. And we are very happy and very proud to join efforts with the Global Foundation of Performing Arts and, and in this particular case with Longi uh, uh, School of Music because uh, we see the value of, of it. We are going to uh, have a conversation today about the healing and the power of, of, of music. I'm very honored to see Karen Zorn here, the uh, president of the Longi College, also to uh, Benjamin Wood, the president of the Global Foundation of Performing Arts, or distinguished set of panelists, I see it in uh, Safimi, I hope I pronounced that well, uh, and also Judith uh, Boss, that uh, have the pleasure to meet them a couple of months ago here uh, in New York. Uh, also Lucia uh, and Byron that are joining us and supporting these activities since, since, since the beginning. So uh, I wish we can uh, um, uh, do more in, the, in this area. We are committed to do so. We have uh, an agreement with the uh, um, uh, Global Foundation of Performing Arts to do that. Uh, this is the reason why we are here today. We have another one with launching uh, for uh, um, a kind of master program on classical music. And we hope that we're going to be successful on that. And we are doing a lot of other, other events. Uh, this uh, event today will be followed for the next one tomorrow. Uh, where we discuss the education, uh, forward thinking um, on public, uh, uh, on music and, and the art of education, uh, uh, classical music. So I, I am very honored and very pleased to uh, help as much as I can. I have uh, my whole team with us. I have Pelayo, Awaz, I have Olga, Patricia. So uh, for Longi, for Global Foundation of Performing Arts, consider UNIT a part of your uh, uh, all hands on deck in, in, in this issue, we will be very, very happy to uh, to continue to host it and to support it and to promote, to amplify the message and also to um, strengthen the cooperation among the institutions. So we'll hope that we will see in the near future, I will uh, intend to uh, put together uh, uh, an office or a desk dedicated to, to these programs 
uh, following the uh, concert in Carnegie Hall that we are uh, um, enabling every year since last year, and also other activities. And I hope the master program also will be uh, a success. I will just stop here because I am not uh, a musician per se. I like to sing in the shower, but that's how far I can go. I love music. I love the uh, theater. So uh, I will leave the uh, professionals to teach us about it and to uh, commit to them my full support uh, and the unitar support for all the endeavors related to the Global uh, Foundation of Performing Arts and uh, Longi. So uh, thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, it's been a pleasure to see you once, once again. And hopefully one day we're going to get together in person and, and, and conference room in the United Nations and we will talk to the international community about this face to face. But by the time being, uh, everybody has to be uh, safe and um, good luck and happy to be here. And I'll be following these sessions with uh, deep interest. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and I yield to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ambassador Suazo, uh, for your kind words. But thank you, more importantly, for your commitment and your energy and your vision uh, to su supporting the full breadth of education for the human for, for the human experience. At the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts, we believe very strongly in the power of the performing arts, in the importance of culture, in helping people understand one another and to actually understand themselves, and a way of bringing people together to look at common ground rather than differences. So I, I really support um, the partnership that we have with UNITAR and the United Nations. And I thank you for helping us, you used a great word, amplify. Uh, you, you helping us to advocate, to, to um, position culture and cultural education at, a, at an important level with policy makers, thinkers, and, and, and the world at large. So um, I'm very happy with our partnership and I'm, I'm very, very happy today to introduce our joint partner, uh, Longi School of Music of Bard College. Um, we have one way in particular to advocate is to actually develop programs with leading arts and cultural educational providers. And we at the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts identified and um, researched widely and we're very happy to partner with Longy School of Music of Bard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you're over the next two hours, you're going to completely understand why, because Longy, which they will have a plenty of time to explain, believes also in the importance of education and the importance of music for everyone. So I'm very happy that in addition to the joint master's program that we have now developed and which is underway, we have a chance today to actually have a discussion and have a conversation and to, to, to share the story of what one of our partners in the educational sphere is doing on the ground in the, in the space of, of, of cultural education. Um, Longy School of Music was founded in 1915 and um, although they've, that sounds like a long time ago, I want to actually say that they're more innovative and more forward-looking than a lot of organizations I've spoken to. So I'm, I'm very happy with the, um, with the way this partnership has come together. It's, it's, uh, UNITAR has for almost 60 years uh, presented courses in many other um, spheres of life, spheres of the, of the global sector. And we together have been able to offer a, a program in cultural education. We think this is equally as important to ensure that we give rounded experiences to uh, humanity. So today, today is in, a, in essence, a presentation of Longy School of Music at work. Uh, and it also is a chance to hear from the leaders of Longy School of Music. I'm delighted that we have President Karen Zorn with us today and we have Dean Judith, Dr. Judith Bose with us today. We also have um, Aaron Zafini and later on we will have Hobbes Safares. Uh, but today is a chance to see Longy in action and also then to follow with a chance for you to ask questions or uh, to invite ongoing discussion to hear more uh, behind the scenes of what is happening um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but 
delivered to the world. So what I would like to do now is invite, or actually before I introduce uh, the video presentation uh, that we're going to watch, I would like to, to say a few words about um, our, the, the leaders of Longy School of Music of Bard College to set some context and to give you some background before we watch what we're going to see. Longy School of Music is a degree granting conservatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts that offers a full spectrum of performance, composition and teaching programs. What I want to do now is introduce um, President Professor Karen Zorn and to say some words to, to, to tell you a little bit about her vision and her background, which leads the programs and the vision and the direction of the Longy School of Music of Bard College in action on the ground. Professor Karen Zorn accepted the position of president of Longy School of Music in 2007. Because in many ways of the school's newly adopted mission to prepare students to make a difference in the world, which as we know, or for many of us know is unlike most or the standard uh, approach of, of, of a number of um, traditional conservatory training. The, mis the mission suggested a fundamentally different approach to music education, and it offered a radically different view of the kind of work that Longy students might seek, create, and engage in after graduation. Professor Zorn has established partnerships, programs, and initiatives that have permanently altered the school's trajectory and positioned it as a leader in equitable music education. Professor Zorn executed the pivotal merger with Bard College in 2012, and has since established numerous strategic partnerships with organizations such as the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Funda Musicale Venezuela, El Sistema, the Music for Healing and Transition Program, and countless Sistema-inspired programs across the country. Professor Zorn co-founded Take a Stand, a collaboration between Longy, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and Bard College, and launched the Master of Arts in Teaching degree program in Los Angeles. Professor Zorn is an active teacher, guest speaker, and frequent consultant for arts organizations and other nonprofits on matters of creative artistry, curricular innovation and leadership. She appears annually at the Verbier Festival, where she teaches courses on artistic innovation and audience engagement, as well as having taught at the Banff Artist Residency Program at Carnegie Hall. And Professor Zorn has been a member of the faculties of Berkeley, McPhail Center for the Arts and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I'd like to say a warm welcome to Professor Karen Zorn. Thank you for being with us this morning. Now I'd like to give a brief background to our other leader, um, co-driver of the forces at Longy School of Music, Dr. Judith Bose, Dean of Longy School of Music of Bard College. Dr. Bose came to Longy having worked as an independent arts education consultant with decades of experience specializing in curriculum development and the intersection of cultural organizations, schools, teachers, and teaching artists. She has worked with Wolf Brown Arts Research Firm on many projects, including the first ever evaluation of El Sistema inspired programs in the US. As Creative Education Director for the Vermont Community Engagement Lab, as Community Engagement Consultant with From the Top, and as a student in the Music for Healing and Transition Program. She previously served as the Director of Teacher Education and Educational Initiatives at Longy School of Music, where she helped to develop the innovative Master of Arts in Teaching Music Degree Program. She has also taught teaching artistry on the faculty of the Peabody Conservatory at Johns Hopkins University. In New York, she was a Master Music Teaching Artist at the Lincoln Center Institute and the New York Philharmonic for 10 years. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dean, Dr. Judith Bose. Good morning. I would also like to add that Karen and Judith are musicians and classically trained themselves. So I would like to also compliment importantly that Professor Zorn studied piano and Dr. Bose is a soprano. 
these things are important, <laughs> I believe, in order to realize when you're educating students in music, to have a music background and, and have a practical experience of where and what music and the performing arts might be helps to mentor and guide the future possibilities of music education. I'm delighted to be joining you from Geneva, where I'm based. Um, my executive director is based in New York. Uh, we work very closely with UNITAR. And it's my pleasure to now hand over to, um, to a video presentation from Longy School of Music. So I invite you, this will run for, for quite a while. So I invite you to take, take a seat, uh, take notes, and we will return with an opportunity to, to ask your questions directly to the leaders of Longy School of Music following the video presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Again, I'm Karen Zorn, president of the Longy School of Music of Bard College. We are delighted to be participating in this workshop, and we are so excited for our new partnership with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts. Joining me today is Dr. Judith Bowes, Dean of the Conservatory of the Longy School of Music of Bard College. Thank you, President Zorn, and thank you all for joining us for our session today, Teaching, Healing, and the Power of Music. As President Zorn mentioned, I am Dr. Judith Bowes, and I am Dean of the Conservatory at the Longy School of Music of Bard College. It is such an honor to be with you today, presenting on the work we do at Longy, sharing stories from our students and alumni, and introducing you to our hybrid Master of Music in Music Education degree and our initiatives around music as a healing art. I would like to begin today by introducing you to the Longy School of Music, as many of you may not know who we are or what we do. Longy is a music conservatory located in the Boston area. The school was founded in 1915 by Georges Langy, an oboist in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and our campus is housed in a beautiful mansion in the middle of the vibrant city of Cambridge. Langy students come to Boston from all corners of the world to study their craft and develop their artistry. But the mission of our school is more specific. It is to prepare musicians to make a difference in the world. I have to say, when I first heard that, the idea really sparked my imagination. Musicians as change makers. This was something I could really get behind. I had seen musicians and music teachers changing the world in practice, but had never considered a conservatory model with this as its primary goal. Now the concept seems so obvious to me. Musicians, artists of all disciplines, are listeners. They are thinkers. They show up every day seeking to understand, curious to learn, determined to connect with others. And music has the singular ability to dispel barriers that halt other forms of communication. It can bridge lingual, cultural, and ideological divides. It can transcend. It can unite. Approaching conservatory education with this lens for the last 15 years has completely altered my perception on the role of musician in society. When the charge is given to the musicians to better their world, we feel an even greater charge as their educational institution to prepare them to do just that. At Longy, we are committed to empowering our students with the knowledge and skills they need to use their art form to make meaningful change. Over the years, I have seen this mission in action. While Longy alumni perform on many of the great stages of the world, they also use their conservatory degrees to work in classrooms with students of all backgrounds and abilities, to lead government agencies and nonprofits, and to serve people in need all around the world. 
These musicians are using the tools they have gained during their degree to address issues in their communities and improve the lives of many. Let me share a few surprisingly consistent things I've noticed with music students, which has helped shift my perspective on our work as music educators. First, students want a variety of meaningful musical experiences. They want to perform, but they want to do so much more. They want their education to prepare them to address big ideas, big issues in our world. Next, there are so many more ways to use music in our world, even more than we can imagine today. Too many music students lose the connection with what inspires them, with what inspired them to become musicians in the first place. And lastly, when students are inspired and passionate about their work, musical excellence follows. Passion drives students to pursue a career in music, but so often along the way, a student's focus shifts from the joy and the freedom of music making to technical perfection. But I have learned that our work as music educators really is to reignite our students' passions and give them the tools they need to turn their art into action. We've seen it time and again. When we teach students to reconnect with their love of music, they tap into their intrinsic motivation and flourish, inventing new ways to create, heal, and inspire. Much of our work is providing students with meaningful outlets for their artistry. At the end of the day, musicians need to know their work matters. And you don't have to take my word for it. Let's hear directly from some Longy students. At Longy, we are all in with you, the next generation of citizen musicians and leaders. We empower you to define and follow your own path. You'll connect your artistic why with how you'll make a difference in the world. I find Longy's environment really welcomes students to foster their own art. I see how my music is impacting other people and to see the world evolving now, I feel like I, as a musician, can make a difference with my music. When I looked back on my music career sort of in between undergrad and grad school, I had a moment where I was like, do I even want to pursue this anymore? And I realized that there had actually been a lot of personal healing in playing music for myself. And then I came to Longy and I realized that they had this amazing program for music as a healing arts. And I realized I need to be doing this. I think that students are really being asked to define what it is that's of the greatest value to them in their work. And then from there, see where that leads. My purpose, now that I've reached Longy, um, is to definitely hone in on my own distinct voice. I can truly dig deep and find my sound, find my voice, and really be confident in what I have to say, because what I have to say is important. Longy has prepared me to be a leader in my field. I'm using all of this knowledge that I got here, and I just want to give my students the tools to express themselves through music. While studying at Longy, it's not just, okay, let me get this degree and move on and keep performing and keep playing. It's about actually going to your community and actually thinking about, what does this look like when I leave here? And how can I make that happen? It's always so inspiring for me to hear from our students and to hear how diverse their passions and interests are. Music is a powerful force in the lives of so many. It is almost universally beloved as a source of celebration, comfort, joy, and so many other things. It's an integral part of the human experience, which makes teaching music such a meaningful endeavor. And what I've seen over the years is that in addition to the importance of teaching and performing, there are countless other ways musicians can create meaningful change. When I imagine the future, 
let's say 20 years from now, I see a world where musicians are seen as essential to society. What if we imagined a world where every child has the opportunity to explore their creativity through music? Every neighborhood strives to build its team of artists who bring music to their communities to address need. Every city government has a plan for deploying musicians into its communities, creating the kinds of neighborhoods that attract new business and draw tourism dollars. Every retirement community sees musicians as essential. Imagine how the quality of life of residents would improve if these communities competed to hire the most exciting and effective musicians. I see a future world where musicians are seen as essential. It's not just because their performances are so transcendent. It's because they have the skills to harness the power of music to directly address needs in our society. They are able to apply the tools that they have learned from their training to address pressing societal issues. And the thing is, there are many musicians doing this kind of work already. Let's take a look at some of the people who are well underway, the early adopters who lead the way for the next generation, doing the work I am talking about, using music to make a difference in the world. First up, meet Vijay Gupta. Vijay is a faculty member from our initial teacher education degree as well as a violinist in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. He's a musician who is making just the kind of change I'm describing. Let's take a look at what Vijay has to say. Artists and performers do not have a choice to not be engaged in social and civic discourse. It is as much our job to heal and inspire as it is to disrupt and provoke. It is our job to be the truth tellers of our time. My name is Vijay Gupta. I am a violinist and educator. There was always music playing in the house I grew up in. Music was a place of worship, a place of calm and belonging, and of real meaning. I auditioned for the LA Film when I was 19. And this orchestra accepted me into their family as a 19-year-old boy. Within a couple of months of joining the orchestra, I started to learn about the story of a homeless man named Nathaniel Ayers, who was the subject of a book and a movie called The Soloist. And I found myself becoming Nathaniel's violin teacher. And Nathaniel and I would have these amazing conversations through music in this courtyard in Skid Row. And so a couple of questions started to come in that moment. Is A, what did it mean to bring music to Skid Row? And B, how many more Nathaniels were out there? Street Symphony is a community of musicians, my colleagues from the LA Philharmonic, from the LA Master Chorale, uh, professional musicians and students from all over Los Angeles of varying different genres of music who present regular monthly engagements in uh, shelters and clinics in Skid Row as well as all five Los Angeles County jails. And the goal of Street Symphony is to engage a historically marginalized community of people through artistic performance, dialogue, and teaching artistry. We took the, the Messiah to the Midnight Mission in Skid Row, which is one of our partner organizations. And the Messiah Project is a chance for the professional musicians of Street Symphony to share our stage with the Skid Row community. Now we work with artists and musicians and singers and composers and instrumentalists who live in Skid Row. And they are our soloists, and they are our curators, and they are the ones who teach us about the power of their artistic voice in their community. I get to play in some of the greatest concert halls in the world. I get to sit next to musicians who have dedicated their entire lives to a craft. And when we sit on that stage and we play together, 
um, we do something singular. It's an experience that may never happen again. Right? It's transcendent. In my mind, the stage is sacred. But I guess the question I'm asking is, why is it that the concert hall is the only sacred stage? What are the other sacred stages across our city and within our hearts where we can also make music? And so when we show up to make music in Skid Row, it's not about being the perfect artistic product. It's about being the most present human being. I love what Vijay said. It's not about the perfect artistic product. It's about being a present human being. It's been a privilege to work with Vijay and such a thrill to have him teach our Longi students. He's such a powerful role model for our future. When I imagine the future, I see a world filled with potential Vijay Guptas, with organizations like Street Symphony cropping up all around the world, partnering with their communities to serve a real need. One of the things I notice in Vijay's video is his energy when he talks about Street Symphony. It reminds me of this quote from Howard Thurman. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. I love that quote, but I think about it slightly differently. Sometimes the way you find what makes you come alive is actually by exploring where there is need. In a lot of ways, Vijay said yes to a need that he stumbled upon, and then he had the vision to see that the need could be assuaged in its own way with music. And he had the skills necessary to build meaningful relationships in his community to create lasting change. Next, I'd like you to meet Gabrielle Molina. Gabrielle is a Bonji alumna. Here's a little bit of her story. In my undergrad, I was studying clarinet performance. And for years, I had thought that my ultimate goal was to be an orchestral musician, sitting principal and playing solos. This was really my idea of success. And I had a few transformative experiences in my undergrad that profoundly shifted the way that I was thinking about my artistry. And in particular, I came across the TED Talk from Jose Antonio Breu about um, El Sistema. And after doing more research and actually leaving the practice room, um, I found the MAT program. I felt like at that time I was finally finding my tribe, finally finding a community of like-minded individuals who were also questioning their role in society as musicians. My entire professional career has been dramatically impacted because I chose to be part of the MAT. And I have been so fortunate that after leaving the MAT, I've traveled the world, um, working with different El Sistema inspired programs, ultimately uh, going on to do a second master's at Harvard and founding an international nonprofit, Teaching Artists International. Gabrielle is now the founder and executive director of Teaching Artists International, a nonprofit that connects teaching artists with socially based music programs around the world. Teaching Artists International provides musicians with hands on opportunities to travel, perform, teach, and support a global network of like minded partners using music as a tool for community development. One of the things we've learned is that music students want to do the kind of work Gabrielle describes. They want to be involved in big ideas that can make real change in the world. One of the ways we know this is from reading the essays that students write as part of their Longi application process. In fact, here's what one of our recent applicants had to say. I am looking for opportunities that deeply integrate the arts with social connection and transformation. In our contemporary times, I can't imagine music looking any other way. 
he's not alone. Here's what another applicant had to say. During my sophomore year in college, I grew extremely interested in community engagement and prison reform. In an attempt to combine the two things that I felt so passionately about, I directed a concert series at a medium security prison. I was struck by how deeply the inmates listened and how profound it is to be able to share music with people from a variety of backgrounds. She goes on to describe starting a strings program at the prison, organizing lessons in violin, viola, and cello, and forming chamber groups. The prison warden told her, your program has created a safer prison and has given the inmates something vital, a purpose. Now, here's what she wants. I want my life as a musician to revolve around supporting my community and helping to create new ones. Finding new and creative ways to teach music is the first step to achieving my goals. I want to continue to bring music into prison systems and create comprehensive plans that make it easier for others to start similar programs. It's incredible. Here is one last excerpt from a Longy student application. I have worked on community-based initiatives to create affordable housing and improve food security. This work helped me realize that I could not divorce my calling as a musician from my responsibility to address people's material needs as well. Now, I can imagine that you might be thinking, well, these students, these particular musicians are not typical. They're somehow anomalies. But actually, we don't think so. Students like this are more and more typical. And yes, more students who apply to Longy do have these kinds of aspirations because of our mission. But young people like this are all around us, and they come from a variety of walks of life and from all over the world. With these global aspirations, you can imagine why we are thrilled to be working with such like-minded organizations as the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts. And now, I am pleased to introduce you to the hybrid degree program that is the centerpiece of our partnership, the Master of Music in Music Education degree. You can imagine that because of our mission, Longy has a different approach to preparing the next generation of music educators. And to tell you a bit about what makes this degree unique, I'd like to introduce the Director of Teacher Education at Longy, Dr. Aaron Zafini. First, the Master of Music in Music Education degree at Longy prepares students to be able to teach anyone, anywhere. From teaching young children in primary school, through young adults in secondary education, all the way through working in higher education, in colleges and in universities. And it also prepares educators for the kinds of community engagement and teaching music in the community that President Zorn and Dean Bowes have just described. And so, while we focus on learning to teach music in schools, we also emphasize the opportunities that lie beyond the walls of formal school environments. Second, I am extremely proud of the faculty in our degree program. In addition to teaching at Longy, they are all deeply engaged in a variety of music teaching contexts, and they work with a huge range of diverse students. Thus, they are able to bring not only theoretical knowledge, but also their vast real-world experience as expert music educators. And third, our approach is based on the idea that while learning the skills of music, people are also learning other equally important skills. They are joyfully learning how to communicate, how to express themselves, 
They are learning about self-discipline and self-esteem and confidence and about how to find their own inner motivation. They are also learning how to be a contributing member of a group or an ensemble and how to work with each other. You might even say they are learning about cultural diplomacy. The kind of learning that Erin described doesn't just happen. It is intentionally fostered through the philosophy that underlies our degree program. And our philosophy is based on research that shows how the brain best learns and how culture matters deeply in the learning process. Culture is the way that every brain makes sense of the world. And when we say the word culture, we are talking about every aspect of a student's identity, not only their race or ethnicity, but their family history, how they grew up, the foods and music and traditions that surrounded them, all the aspects of their experiences that make them who they are. The brain uses all this cultural experience to make meaning and to take in new information. American educator Zaretta Hammond says that if we imagine that the brain is a kind of computer and that the physical brain is the hardware, well, culture is like the software that programs the brain. So Longi is a part of a growing educational community who is working with a culturally responsive approach to education. That means we take very seriously every aspect of a student's identity because we know that affects how their brains are able to learn and to make music. Further, we believe that each student is whole and capable and that the teacher's job is to create musical learning experiences that build on the strengths of the students rather than on the weaknesses. Say we are looking for the assets or what makes up the students experience and capabilities rather than assuming the deficits taking an inventory of all the things they don't know yet or what they have not yet experienced. It also means that we are creating a music curriculum that has both mirrors and windows. What do I mean by mirrors and windows? Well, a mirror is something that might reflect back to the student their own cultural identity or lived experience. But they should also have windows into new types of music, new experiences, and new understanding. So including the mirrors in the curriculum allows us to build larger windows. Now, Here's a small thought exercise we can all try together. Please join me and take a moment to imagine in your own mind a song that is very familiar to you from your childhood. Perhaps it is a folk song from your country of origin or something that your family played or sang or listened to. As you remember it, and maybe even hear it in your own head, take note of how that makes you feel. Notice what your body feels like. And notice what your mind is doing, what you're thinking about. If you have a pen and paper nearby, you might even make a few notes and I'll pause for a moment to give you some space.
I can imagine that many of you may have felt a calm and familiar feeling. Some of you might even describe it as comforting or warm. But even if you had some other kind of emotion, there is likely something deep there that attaches you as an expert to your own memory, your own experience. Well, I'd like to share with you that neurological research shows that this kind of familiarity does several important things for our brain. It relaxes our brain so that we do not feel scared or threatened. You see, from ancient times, there is a primal part of our brain that is wired to be on the lookout for danger and threat in order to survive. And when new information is coming at us, our brain often defaults into that state of being alert and even a little scared. This is exactly the wrong kind of neurological state to be in to learn something new. Fear does not help us learn, research has shown. But feeling at home, feeling in familiar territory, feeling confident, understood, and respected, these things do help our brain prepare to encounter something new or unfamiliar. So now, if you imagine that you are just five or six years old and in a music class, and your teacher started the class by playing or teaching that song you just remembered in your head. Can you imagine how that would have made you feel? Can you imagine how you might have engaged in that class and joined in because of how comfortable you felt? And what if that teacher had even gone one step further and asked you to help teach that song to your classmates? You might be learning something very important about your own capabilities and confidence and competence. And now your brain is in a different place to learn something new. Beethoven's Ode to Joy or a Brahms lullaby or a folk song from a different country. You will actually absorb new music differently. Well, this is a simple explanation of how mirrors and windows might work. And the secret is, it doesn't just work for five and six year olds. It is true all the way through adulthood. Now, these are just some of the basic building blocks that underlie our philosophical approach to educating musicians to be music teachers in our hybrid Master of Music in Music Education degree program. But now, why don't we hear from some students enrolled in the degree program? We are facilitators. We need to create an environment for them to achieve their best. And their best has to do with music, but we also want them to be good human beings. When I was getting my master's in composition, I love composing, but during that period, I realized that when I've always had the most fun is when I've been at, in front of an ensemble, conducting, teaching music, leading. I didn't realize the impact it had, but people started coming to me and they were saying, this really got me through a tough time. I've always had so much fun in that rehearsal space. So I realized where I need to be is building community. So music education, that, that's where we get to do that. One thing that uh, I see Longi is looking at is the priority of musicians engaging with communities, not just uh, being good at the instrument, not just being a great performer or a great musician, but it's also about what is the impact that you're doing with your music. 
I picked Lanji because of its emphasis on culturally responsive teaching and bringing diversity into the classroom. I think that's something that's just so sorely needed right now um, in music education and education in general. When I first started the Masters of Music of Education at Longy. First, I just needed it to finish my degree for, for school so I could continue teaching. I wanted a program that wasn't the easiest program. I wanted to learn something and I wanted to be able to take what I learned and really put it in my classroom. This opportunity is so special for me um, to be able to take this moment and to do my online degree. It was so much more accessible for me. It fit my lifestyle and it just seemed like a really good fit. And especially because it was so relevant. What's cool about the faculty here is the majority of them are actively teaching and they bring in some really important perspectives. They teach us as if we are the students. So we learn by doing. I'm going into schools and I'm helping out. I'm getting now the opportunities to begin teaching. I'm leading sectionals. The exposure that they're going to have while doing this program is a lot. You basically, you're jumping in and that's preparing you for the next year. After this program finishes up, I'll have everything I need to take the test to get a credential, of the master's degree. I'm ready to go straight into public schools. Um, I can go teach at private schools. There's a lot I can do after this. Launchy's program is so important because it makes you realize as a teacher, how much of an impact you have on your students. Music is such an innate part of the human experience that the more people who understand it and who can use music to communicate, the better. And I think we can just have a better world that way. Here is what some of our alumni have said about our teacher education degree programs. You know, I had spent so many years in the practice room trying to perfect excerpts and my legato, and I was trying to figure out how these things actually intersect in making the world a better place. And the Longy MAT program was really the place for me to explore those ideas. One week you might be performing in the Walt Disney Concert Hall, and the second week you might be performing on Skid Row. And there's no other place on the planet that you can go as a musician where you can combine these types of ideas um, and, and be surrounded by other musicians who are just equally as excited and jazzed as you are to be digging in and to be digging in deep. My name is Angelica Cortez and I was a student for the teacher education program at Longy School of Music. My mission in life is really to make sure that all young people, regardless of their backgrounds, have access to really high quality music education. Music education has really uh, traditionally been accessible to such a small group of people. And what's at risk is us losing the next Beyonce, is us losing the next Luis Miguel. It's a huge risk for us to not make sure that every young person has access to creativity. The first time I really realized my calling was actually in teaching private trumpet lessons. I was working um, with someone who was a veteran of World War II and he was just interested in connecting back with trumpet. So I gave him a few lessons and I just loved watching him connect with his creativity. I loved watching him learn the trumpet. I was fortunate to have a teacher who noticed that I lit up anytime I talked about teacher education. So he suggested I check out the Longy teacher education program. I got to sit in on a class and it was about aspects of identity. I was watching the students learn and understand who they were and learn and understand how their identities impacted their work and their goals. And it was at Longy that I got to really um, intertwine a bit more of who I am uh, into the work that I want to do. I was very fortunate to have a lot of teachers believe in me and invest in me even in moments where I wasn't sure that I was worth investing in. And certainly at Longy, 
there are teachers and educators that believe in you and see something in you and want to invest in you. Angelica is an amazing human being and individual and leader because she's never forgotten why she's in this work in the first place. She's an amazing listener and she's approachable. I think we know, right, that that young person just needs an extra 10 minutes or just an extra push or an extra challenge. It is so much fun and such an honor and a privilege to get to see that. Longy School of Music does such an amazing job preparing educators uh, because they, they help them to center their learning, their work, their teaching around the needs of the student. It's really rare that you walk into a space and instantly feel community with folks, but Longy tends to attract people who are interested in thinking about music as more than just um, an art form, but actually as a tool for justice, as a tool for inspiration, as a tool for moving people to do the things that are most important to them. So it's not just thinking about how can I get better at what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's important too. But in addition to that, we get to think about what impact we want to have. How are we going to offer our gifts to the world? There is one more student I would like you to hear from. Meet Victor Effiong and see how culturally responsive teaching has allowed him to reimagine even his own artistry. Also, we didn't want today's program to go by without allowing you to sit back, relax, and enjoy a performance. My name is Victor Effiong. I'm from Cross River State, Calabar, the Effic tribe in Nigeria. When something happens to somebody, Everybody comes together to either celebrate with the person or commiserate with the person if it's a death. We believe in call and response. Uh, the reason is that that is how our kind of music is. The call is that everybody has to respond, just like in the olden days, our ancestors, if they wanted to give an information in the clan, uh, the town crier will hit the gong, giving the call, and then people responded by coming to the palace. So that is where we got the call and response and brought it into music. I decided to write this song just to remember the dead, to remember those who have lost their loved ones. It's just a way to make people understand that whatever they're passing through, they are not alone. We see what's going on, we feel their pain, and um, we are trying to be around them to give them the consolation they deserve and that they need. And so we pray that the memory of their loved ones will always remain with us as we do the search together.
This hybrid Master of Music and Music Education degree with an in-person component is the centerpiece of our partnership with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts. As we consider our future plans for this partnership, though, it leads us to a second possible initiative, using music as a healing art. So many students now want a future where they are useful and can affect change. They want to find something that helps them come alive, and they want their work to address real societal need. Today, I want to take a deeper look with you into therapeutic music, using music to heal and to comfort, and so much more. I want to show you a short clip from a film that I think illustrates so well what I cannot put into words myself. The film is called Alive Inside, a documentary film that follows a social worker as he explores using music with patients suffering from dementia. Some of you may have already seen this film. Let's take a look at a clip from the film. This is Henry's story. His name is Henry Drea. Uh-huh. And I'm looking more or less for religious music for him. Okay. Because he enjoys music and he always quotes in the Bible. So I'd rather have that for him. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. I found your music. Uh, you want you want your music now? Well, not me. Okay. Let's, let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. Mm -hmm. And immediately, he, he lights up. His face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms. And he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduce the music to him, this is his, his reaction ever since. <laughs> Philosopher Kant once called music the quickening art, and Henry is being quickened, he's being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just huh? to ask you a few questions. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to give it back to you. Uh huh. Okay. The effect of this doesn't stop because when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry? Yeah? Um, do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. Well, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one, I mean. Uh, uh, so no do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound. Did beautiful. You did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. W what was your favorite music when you were young? Well, well I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy, I like. They did the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy. What was your fav favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh. I'll be home before Christmas. Oh. You can come plant on me with plenty of snow, mistletoe, present, red brand new tree. Ow! So, in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He is uh, uh, remembered. Uh, who he is, and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? It gives me the feeling of love, no, no mass. Because right now the world needs to come into music singing. you got beautiful music here. 
beautiful, oh, lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, the dream. I think this is such an amazing example of the power of music to tap into what is truly human. I think this paints a clear picture of how music can make a difference in a person's life. It can connect us with our deeper self and in turn with each other. As Oliver Sacks said, music helps them find their place in the world again. Now let's consider the fact that there are over 55 million people with dementia in the world today. Imagine what that number will be in 10 years. And imagine how music could be used to make a difference in all those lives. At Longy, we believe addressing dementia alone opens up an entire world's demand for more musicians trained in therapeutic music. We are already doing this work at Longy, and we're interested in doing more. We began by asking, what if we deployed music students who understood how to use music for healing in hospitals, assisted living programs, and other healthcare facilities? To do that, our students learn and practice techniques for how to be a healing presence and how to use music to bring comfort. And then they go out into the community and practice what they've learned. On a regular basis, students say that these are some of their favorite and most meaningful experiences as musicians, and that learning these techniques has changed how they think about all of their performances, not just those in healthcare facilities. I think this is connected to what Vijay Gupta said. It's not about a perfect artistic product. It's about being present as a human being. Let's take a look at what our music as a healing arts students have to say. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel if, if you had a pro just closing your eyes and listening to it, if you had a problem, it kind of, kind of goes away a little bit. I, I love music anyway. You will. You will. You both have to come back. Yes. No, it's great. We enjoy it very much. This class changed my perspective on what venues are possible. That it's not really just like the concert hall and the traditional stage. That like there are people who can't get to those to the concert hall who need the music. Yeah, I think my perspective was changed on like what even is a performance and like so many times we think of it as being like this stiff, I'm on the stage and you're in the audience kind of experience. Um, but we were reminded just like ways that we could interact yeah, with audiences and make it meaningful, not just for us, but for them. At the, at the, one, at the one nursing place in Santa Maria, I'm not sure, there was a, in a far corner, there was a, one old lady in, her wheelchair, like sitting like this during the whole concert. One moment I start improvising some jazz, and I was, you know, playing, and, and then I look in the corner and she was like smiling and like saying, Woo, yeah, that, that's the spirit. But this class uh, made me think that we need more musicians in this world because this world is going crazy and, you know, we have all this bad news. And I think musicians, we have a superpower. We can bring you with one note in a present moment. I feel like this course has definitely helped me make a difference in the world already um, because I feel like I've been given already an opportunity to serve people through my music and having those experiences and seeing how it changed our lives even for those few minutes really has motivated me to continue to do that. Earlier, I shared with you what research is showing us about how culture affects the brain and how that profoundly influences music learning. But now, I'd like to share with you that there is also a vast body of scientific research that shows how music can have a profound impact on the body. This evidence forms the basis for our work in our healing arts programs. 
We know that music has a significant influence on biological functions, as well as emotional and psychological responses. In the following videos, we will see an interesting natural phenomenon known as entrainment. Entrainment describes how two bodies in close proximity will naturally align, especially when it comes to rhythmic pace. Now, let's take a look at two very different examples of entrainment. It's so interesting to see the dog's response to the music and even how two mechanical devices will sync rhythmically. Therapeutic musicians learn how to use entrainment, particularly to stabilize vital signs like heart rate and breathing rate. They often utilize rhythm and tempo, but also pitch range, mode, tone quality, all of these elements can have very specific biological and psychological results. Now let's try just one other exercise together. In a moment, one of our Longi alumni who is certified in therapeutic music through our programs, Hope Salazar, will share with you a very short bit of music. As you listen, please, once again, notice deeply how you are physically responding. You may take more notes or just pay attention, but notice things like your heartbeat, your breathing rate. Notice any other sensations in your body and maybe even notice where your thoughts travel. Especially notice if anything changes as the music progresses.
Welcome back. Perhaps some of you noticed that as the music changed, so did some of your sensations. Maybe you noticed small shifts or maybe more dramatic ones. Well, here is one of the ways a therapeutic musician like Hope may create a healing environment. Suppose he encountered a patient or a person who was agitated in some amount of pain or even someone who had a fast paced heart rate. He might want to use therapeutic music to bring some stability, balance or calmness to that individual. Now, instinctively, you might think, okay, that's simple. Then he should play some slow, calming music right away. But actually, if we pay attention to the science of entrainment that we just saw earlier, it shows us that this would not be the best approach. The therapeutic musician would first want to entrain as closely as possible with what the patient might be experiencing. This then leads the therapeutic musician to make specific choices about pitch and rhythm, tempo and tone. So a person with a heart rate that is too fast should be met first with music at that tempo and then once entrained, music can do a much better job of shifting down and changing those biological functions. This would be somewhat like the shift or change many of you may have noticed in our brief exercise while listening to Hope's music. Now, imagine how powerful it would be if you were in the room with Hope and he were able to entrain specifically to your own individual heartbeat and breathing rate. Here is a very short list of just some of the things that therapeutic musicians are trained to do. Relieve anxiety. Reduce stress and stabilize blood pressure, heart rate, or breathing rate. Support pain management. Aid mental focus in patients experiencing dementia. Stabilize vital signs in acute patients. Just imagine what kinds of changes and shifts music as a healing art might be able to bring to people all over the world. The possibilities are endless and the need is great. Well, you just met Hope through his music, but here is his story. In it, you'll learn about yet another population that can be deeply affected through music as a healing art. My son was my first patient. He was born prematurely around 32 weeks, so he had to spend a month in the hospital. The main thing that he was having troubles with was um, breathing and eating, so the, most of his food would, would be through a, a feeding tube. So my mentor, uh, Aline Benoit, encouraged me to bring my violin and start putting what I was learning in my MHTP program into the hospital. The first time I brought my violin to the NICU, I started playing for my son. And after a little while, I started to notice that the nurse was bringing other cribs into the, the NICU room where my son was. And all of a sudden, I had like 10 cribs in front of me. And all the babies uh, stopped crying after a little while. And then I started playing a, a movement of Bach that I used to play for my wife when she was pregnant. As soon as I started playing that song, he just simply smiled. 
I was amazed how music changed the room, changed the atmosphere of the hospital, where the hospital became a sanctuary of feeling loved and feeling hope. And this particular nurse that was a little bit skeptical about me coming to play, uh, she, she tapped my shoulder and she said, I think you should come at least once a week. Once I start doing the, uh, the therapeutic live music uh, for my son, I started to notice how much it was helping him to breathe on his own and eat on his own. It was really remarkable to see every night how his apneas decreased. He went from having five, six a day to eventually having none. When he started eating, he started eating uh, on his own one time a day, around five to 10 milliliters of milk. As I continued to play, he started to eat 20, 30, 40, 50, 80. Eventually, uh, he was eating on his own without the feeding tube. That was really uh, a miracle for us because we were expecting him to stay there until 40 weeks full term, uh, but he was able to come home uh, around 37 weeks. The MHTP program really taught me that music is not just an art form, that it's really a powerful force that can help provide a, a, an environment of healing. Isn't it amazing to hear what this work can do for people with such diverse experiences? Now, what you heard Hobe describe anecdotally in his story is actually supported by scientific research. This research shows that organized sound interventions can be very significant and beneficial during the last six to seven weeks of pregnancy or the first weeks of life for a premature baby such as Hobe's. Here are some of the things we know about the development of a baby's brain. The foundation of a functioning brain is assembled prenatally. All newborn babies have all the types of brain cells they'll have for the rest of their life. The third trimester of development is crucial. At least one million new neural connections are made every second, more than at any other time in life. So the most significant brain development occurs in the last weeks of pregnancy. There is a growing body of research that tells us that music can impact the developing brain. For example, we know that music perception activates multiple brain regions and stimulates full cerebral processing. Early music experience significantly increases neuroplasticity. Music perception improves connectivity in the cortex in preterm newborns. And music learning begins in the womb. This research seems to corroborate what our therapeutic musicians are observing in their sessions in neonatal care units in the hospital. Today, the Music Cognition Lab at Longy is involved in research that will investigate the efficacy of live therapeutic music offered to premature babies during their critical first weeks of life and how this intervention might affect brain development and a cognition. Imagine all the ways that therapeutic music is needed in the world right now. Imagine how much therapeutic musicians employed in neonatal intensive care units could impact the lives of newborn babies and new parents. Imagine a world where every retirement community engages musicians to play concerts, teach lessons and classes for the residents, and bring comfort and care through all the phases of aging. Imagine a future where every hospice and palliative care unit employs a therapeutic musician 
to aid and improve the experience of end of life. And for us, this is just the beginning. How might the techniques inherent in culturally responsive teaching and therapeutic music be applied to conflict resolution in the classroom? How might these principles help two parties negotiate from a place of respect and understanding? We believe advanced training in this discipline could result in incredible opportunities for our students and our world. I am sure you can also see why we feel so aligned with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts and why it has felt like such a natural partnership. With our relationship already underway in our Master of Music and Music Education degree, we can imagine a second chapter of a partnership with a certification or a degree program in music as a healing art and we cannot wait to see this impact over time. Thank you again to everyone at the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. It has been our honor to present for you all today, and now we are so excited to be able to hear your thoughts and questions live. Thank you so much. Um, wow. <laughs> I should be more formal, but wow. Uh, that was very powerful. Thank you so much for, um, well, in particular, Professor Zorn and Judith both for, for really demonstrating um, not only the commitment, but the practice, the theory and the practice, the, the research and the um, training models that, that Longy School of Music of Bard College is already undertaking and has um, has has been doing for some time. That was that was um, that was a fantastic way of showing what you do. I don't think that we could have done that in in a different format on this platform. So so th so thank you for the for the deep dive. Um, I'm really taken by the by the fact that you want musicians to make an impact, to be citizens, to to give back, to be more than practitioners, practitioners, practitioners on stage. And uh, I, I think you, you were, you were able to go into that into, into such great detail. Um, I would very much like to, to, to hand the floor um, over to you, Professor Zorn, well, Karen, to say, just to say some words in response and, uh, and, and then we'll open the floor for, for, for discussions or, or questions that any of the audience might have. But, but please say a few words off camera for us. <laughs> thank you so much, Benjamin. And um, also just thank you to everyone who's here today um, for your interest and your attention. We're absolutely grateful. Um, yeah, it, it's, uh, I think, how we think about music in the world um, is in some ways uh, complex, it's not simple. And so that was what led us to um, really thinking about how we could actually tell the story of our, philo both the philosophy really of how we see the world and how we see, we see a world that needs more musicians, not fewer. Um, and there is there is such a strong narrative and has been for a while, especially in the classical music world, um, that there actually are not enough places for musicians to actually place the graduates from conservatories across the world. You know, so if you think about the sort of elite pursuit of playing on the great stages of the world, in some ways that's true, right? There aren't enough. Uh, openings at any given orchestra in any given year to place all the violinists who graduate and who are perfectly capable of playing in those orchestras. So, so there's truth to that narrative, but um, we just, we have a much more, I would, I guess, say optimistic view of the need um, for musicians in our world. We just see so many more ways that musicians can be helpful. Um, and it's also, a, it's a more optimistic view for these young musicians or for any musician actually of any age. If you think about that you are needed and that there are things that music can do in the world that really cannot you know, be solved by other things. This very basic human need for music um, 
leads us really to this um, optimistic and open, sort of open wide lens of how we think the world should view musicians. And in many ways, it goes back to ancient times and the role of a musician. You know, what was it? Why do we actually have music in the world? Where did this motivation come from, this desire to communicate, you know, either be heard or to communicate with each other? Um, so it's not, our, our way of thinking is not new, actually. I think it's just, um, you, you know, the, sometimes uh, we lose our way. <laughs> and uh, we, this is a way of actually coming back to um, basic human needs. Um, and how music might actually address so many things in our lives. Um, so, so I guess that's a, a, a little bit of an introduction for or an additional thoughts to um, what has led us to discover some non-traditional approaches and roles for musicians. And scope and need and and advancement. I'm, I, I completely agree. I mean, it, music can do many things and can be can contribute to many things um, and musician i've worked with classical musicians for many many years and even the most elite or child prodigies they want to engage they want to connect they want to share their voice with audiences wherever those audiences are it's up to us to to, to help remind them that there are audiences everywhere um, uh, Dr. Bose, I'd like to I'd like to pass the floor to you because I really thank you for balancing with 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 with, with some of the neuroscience and some of the um, I love the rhythmic entrainment sequence in that video and we do come together when we are we come together at concerts we come together everywhere so um, if you'd like to say a few words about about that aspect of of your research it was fascinating. Sure, I'd be happy to. And um, before I begin, I just want to say again how honored we are, <clears throat> excuse me, to be sharing this platform today with Global Foundation for the Performing Arts um, and with UNITAR with the United Nations Institute for um, Teaching and Research. So thank you, Benjamin, and thank you, Ambassador Suazo. We're, we feel so fortunate to be with like-minded colleagues and to be forging this partnership um, and yes, Benjamin, just to, to pick up on the, the last words that you uttered there, we, we fully believe that, yes, there are the world's great concert stages, and those are important, but there are so many other stages, <laughs> right, or important, important places for musicians to be in um, community, right, and to be sharing their music. And I think that Again, you know, it's it's something that we tried to say in the in the short film that we made. Musicians have been anecdotally noticing this profound experience for some time, and um, what we have tried to do at Longi is really <clears throat> back that understanding and that anecdotal experience with with what the research is showing, so that we are um, building our healing arts program not just just because we notice the profound difference that it makes for patients in the room for communities for infants but because we are delving deeply into why that is um and we are we're trying to play a role in our in our small part um our corner of the universe in how we can contribute to that research how we can contribute to that understanding and how we can do both things, build the theoretical um, and um, foundational knowledge that our students need, but also give them plenty of real world experience. And that is true in the healing arts and that is true in education. Um, we are incredibly proud of the way that we um, teach musicians to become teachers themselves, to become educators themselves. And so we're really proud that um, again, I think as President Zorn said in the video, the centerpiece of our the beginning of our partnership with GFPA and with UNITAR is this hybrid master's program in the art of teaching. Um, that, that we just believe is the way to begin to spread these experiences and this knowledge. Um, so we're grateful. 
We're very much aligned. I, on that topic, you talk about teaching musicians to be able to teach um, where they are and be the best teachers they can be. And I'd like to pass to um, or call in uh, Dr. Zafini here. Um, Hi, Erin, welcome. And you're the director of, of, of teaching engagement and, and the director of this program that we've developed in partnership. Um, I really enjoyed your thing that you wanted that you want your educators to be able to teach anyone anywhere. You know, I think these are the sorts of things we're all believing in that everybody can make a contribution. Um, that's a big, that's a big thing, but you obviously are doing it and succeeding. So would you like to talk a little bit about um, about the program itself and, and how you teach anyone anywhere how to teach music. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Benjamin, so much for um, for allowing me this time to share about our program a little bit more. Um, but I, I do want, I do feel like I, giving context about myself and how this program was developed is really, really important. Um, so I myself am a, a teacher. And my experiences have been that I was not trained to teach anyone anywhere. And this is a real problem in education, at least, at least in the United States, I would say. And so when you are not trained to teach anyone anywhere, you quickly see that in your classroom. You see it with students not being engaged, students separating music in school from music in real life, students not seeing themselves in the classroom, not see, not feeling valued for who they are. And so this hybrid Master of Music and Music Education program really emphasizes putting our students front and center. And, I, and I'm not just talking about classroom music, I'm talking about ensembles, even private studio teaching, um, even children as early as birth, in the womb, all their students are everywhere in every single setting, everywhere we go. It is not necessarily this traditional definition of teaching and learning. And so teaching them anyone, anywhere, really means that we just honor the students who are in the room yep. and we include music that reflects who they are as people, like, like President Zorn has said, and like President, and like Dean Bose has said, mirrors and windows, right? And so we want our students to feel welcome in our setting, where, wherever that might be. We want them to have a say in what they're learning. We want to not be the experts in the room all the time, but allow our students to be experts as well, because honestly, they really are experts. They're experts that do not come to us empty without any knowledge. They have so much knowledge. And so at Longi in this hybrid master of music and music education degree, we really view teaching and learning very differently. Whereas in the, in the traditional model of teaching and learning, the teacher is up here and the students are down here and the teacher knows everything and the students are just there taking it all in. But we really view it as an equal partnership of teachers and learners, where a teacher will know something, students will know other things, and they teach each other, they collaborate, they work together. And, and that's really the ethos of what we mean by teaching anyone anywhere, is really just a facilitative model as opposed to a top-down model that I was brought up with, that so many people were brought up with. We are we are turning music, music education on its head. That's so perfectly said. Um, what what <laughs> instrument did you come from? Uh, what, I'm vocal. What... I'm also a soprano. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you've had plenty of experience of, but but this is this is my experience too. Um, mm -hmm. for a, for a number of years, I ran one of the world's top music competitions, and a lot of musicians graduate with a lot of skills in performance but their future is going to be so varied, their professional future, their professional career, their professional future, their livelihoods will be so varied as musicians, as we call them. And, but they're not, they're not equipped necessarily with the skills to be able to flex and jump and, and pivot to, to where their careers and career opportunities may take them. And I, I'm, I'm really grateful and thank you for, Longi, for putting a whole lot of different alumni experiences in perspective in your video to show the breadth and depth of where musicians go and what their lives actually are outside 
of rehearsal rooms. Um, if I can, I would like to uh, say hello and 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 welcome uh, Hob Salazar, who has joined us, uh, I believe, from Bolivia. Thank you very much for 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 joining us. Um, Hob Salazar is a violinist, uh, and of course, is connected with with Longi and was featured in the in the in the the um, uh, the video we were just able to see. Um, your story is very profound and very personal about um, what you learned. Talk about theory and practice. I mean, this was the absolute demonstration of 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 you applying your um, culturally responsive and adaptable um, training that you had. Uh, you're a violinist. You're 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 attached with to the um, uh, the the. I believe it's the Harvard Baroque Chamber Orchestra, but you performed all over. Your your piece was very very powerful, and and especially the part where you were playing not just for your son but for other people's sons. Would could you talk a little bit about that? And had anybody taught you when you were learning violin that one, or had had that idea ever con ever entered your head that you might be performing for different types of audiences in the future? Hello, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Please uh, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. I um, I just I just landed. I mean, I just came from a different city. I just landed in La Paz, Bolivia. So I'm in the airport. Um, I, you know, um, I had a, a, a you know a similar experience uh, of 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 hierarchy of uh, you know of of, of learning. I actually had a very negative experience uh, learning when I was a child, um, where uh, you know I, I was told many times, you know, you you should you should do something else. Violin is not for you. Yeah, um, and I I think that was a, actually a good thing because um, it made me realize uh, that I learned through my own experience that there's always a way. You just have to be patient enough to 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 figure out the way to to figure out anything you know you want, um, and that uh, set of skills uh, that I gained in you know earlier in my life once I arrived to to Lungi, um, uh, I had a you know wonderful teachers there that made me realize that music is uh, not just you know, a beautiful art that is, um, it's powerful. It's powerful stuff. And if you're patient and willing to, to fail, because not, you know, it doesn't work every time as you want. If you're willing to fail, that's when I learned. Um, so I got comfortable with making mistakes. I got comfortable with, with uh, you know, doing or playing the wrong song, the wrong rhythm. Um, and, and I would say that's probably one of the best things I, I've learned and I can teach, you know, wherever I go. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And thank you for sharing that. Are you still performing for, I don't want to just say young people, Babies or young children, but are you still performing in medical settings or in 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 um, patient settings? Yes, I do. Um, and right now, um, it's mostly uh, people who uh, who are declining in health um, that are at the end of life, which is you know very different, and uh, people with. Uh, Dementia, Alzheimer, and that's that's what I've been doing. Um, I'm doing currently. Well, thank you very much for your contribution, and and um, and thank you especially for joining the panel today. Uh, I greatly appreciate it, um, Professor Zorn. I was I I was very speaking of end of life. I th I thought your piece on what we can do and what music can do, and not just in a 
you know, in a polite way, but in a in a profound um, way, can can do with older aging or end end of life experiences is is really something again that's that it just is not taught or considered at in traditional music education. Um, I, I, I can see enormous potential in that space. And this is obviously part of why you're working on this healing um, program that would become a specialty at Longi. Yeah, you, uh, you could say, I mean, part of my job really is to think about how we enact this mission, this very special mission that we have. And so a piece of that is also, you know, really investigating what are, where are their needs that musicians could meet, which is what led us to um, really thinking about um, music as therapeutic music and music in healthcare settings and so much more than that. Um, obviously, you know, one of the things we deal with in society is how we treat the elderly. And um, what happens, you know, not in just the last phase of life, but as we head toward um, those, you know, la the last decade of life and what does life even look like? Um, and one of the things that we know is that even when someone has severe dementia, many of those, those people, those patients can still very effectively respond to music. So where there is no, no other response. Um, music is is really the last, I guess, the last thing to to go. One could say, right? The la the last sort of connection that people with severe dementia have. Um, and so, you know, for us, it's like, why wouldn't we, right? Why wouldn't we explore how musicians might be able to interact with people who are you know, struggling in that way and help, you know, help them reconnect with who they are, have their families see, right, yeah. that they're still, that they're still in there. Um, and so for us, this is just, a, it's incredibly exciting work. I think that's going to develop over the next years for us and probably decades. I, we just sort of see the tip of the iceberg right now, don't we? It's, and it's Completely. so so meaningful it's this both good for yeah. society and also good for musicians to be able to feel so useful yeah um, it's the right thing to do at the right time i mean one thing that is really clear and one thing that was compelling for us when we were forming the partnership with longi is the is the world we are all human beings but our, all our cultural experiences are different and the, the approach to aging in different countries in the world is different and what you're doing and i really appreciate about the courses that you're delivering are capacity for the educators to then adapt to wherever they are and that involves not just in my opinion the places they perform or the or the or the things they build but even when they travel internationally when they move countries when they move to really also learn about what do we think we are you know what what is our culture well, how has that defined me so international cultural um tolerance is is very important at the moment so again tolerance and listening um are probably two of the key things that i think you're contributing um we've had quite a few uh comments and um a lot of people resonating with with the work that they've seen in the video so i would like to say that this this uh this workshop this conference is being um recorded and will be posted later um through the unitar website and through the gfpa website and we'll make sure uh it can be also posted through longi school of music of bard college as well um the discussions are are very powerful and very broad and they're much more than just learning to play um, the piano properly and uh, you really have delivered and expanded on the on the theme of, of the power of music today. Um, Dean Bose, I'd like you to, we, we've worked hand in hand on the ground in, in, in getting the program up and running. Um, I know that some of the students are now with you. Uh, I'm um, and we look forward to more students joining you. Uh, I think it's just fantastic that we can build on a program you already have, but tailor it for, for, for an international audience. 
Yes, that's right, Benjamin. It's been really um, a thrill to work directly with GFPA and with UNITAR. Um, we just as you said, Benjamin, you know, we have sort of a portfolio of um, approaches and programs in music education. And this one that we are building in, in partnership with you is sort of custom, custom designed. Um, so it's hybrid, there's an in person component and some virtual learning. It's really built for a global audience, it's really meant to be relevant for a wide variety of teaching contexts that might present themselves all around the world. As Aaron said, our approach to edu education is always that we are, we are learning as much as we're teaching. It's sort of a mutual sharing. Um, we are thrilled that some of our first students are beginning uh, just at the end of this month. Um, and that we look forward to a really rich future of serving as many folks worldwide as are interested in taking a part of this. A, a big part of our dream um, that, is, that is bolstered by coming together with you all is access. We really believe that we have developed these programs and we want to make them accessible for folks that um, also have this interest and this desire and this passion. So um, it's really, really just a dream of ours to be coming together with you all. Um, and I know um, the ambassador, uh, Ambassador Suazo has, has sent a few words um, in, the, in the chat here that he wanted to be sure that we shared. Um, again, you know, he, he wanted to um, express his support of GFPA and these, these cultural partnerships. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the parts that Longi has shown about working with different communities, um, he, he sent a few words that said he believes this is one of the strongest elements that should be considered in um, what he calls the soft power of cultural diplomacy and just how, how strongly he believes this will help us promote sustainable development and the kind of goals that the UN is prioritizing right now, um, this, this use of music as cultural diplomacy. Um, so I think we're all expressing this mutual gratitude for having found each other, being able to custom design some of our programming together to be able to best serve the world, really. Yeah, I, I couldn't have put it better because the, the um, a, an important fact um, is that the, 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 there are many ways of solving or problems or, or improving the world. But there are, and often we look to the most obvious. We look to, of course, we look to conflict resolution. We look to peacekeeping. We look to all these sort of emergency um, provisions. But there's also education. There's also ongoing learning. There's also adaptable te ad 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 adaptive teaching, um, tailored teaching, uh, confidence building. All these skills that um, you've shown us through your alumni that your musicians are living and breathing and making a change on a real day-to-day -day level in their communities. Uh, I know um, that your students come from all types of um, professional experience, all types of classes. They're all give a lot of your, a lot of them are taking this course and they've already been educating, um, but there's obviously a lot that you have on, under your belt that you can um, teach them and and they can learn to, to upskill and to, and to share and to share their capacity. So um, we're delighted to be uh, supporting this, and thank you once again so much for creating that um, really detailed and 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 you know the best way to do it uh, um, uh, video to show us your work in practice. Um, and uh, tomorrow we have a, uh, another conference running from the same time from 10 a.m to 12 noon uh, on the same platform with uh, unitar it's de dedicated to arts and cultural education and tomorrow's session is not um, uh, is is comprises uh, individual um, uh, practitioners in the space. Uh, from different institutions, from different places, from different experiences. Um, and they will be sharing some of their thoughts about uh, cultural education and arts education. 
And um, it's a broad group from um, the Concert Artists Guild, from the Verbier Festival, from um, Bocconi University in Milan, from Oberlin College in the US, and from the Siemens Arts Program from Berlin. Uh, so we're looking at mentorship, we're looking at professional development, we're looking at um, uh, guidance, we're looking at different angles. But uh, today, so I really encourage you to, um, to register for tomorrow's session, which also will be recorded and then posted, um, posted online. Education is very important to us. It's very, it's key to the work of UNITAR. And I would like to once again, thank UNITAR for putting educa cultural education front and center this week. Um, it's, I'd like to also thank the team at UNITAR, Palaio, Olga, um, and all the helpers behind the scenes. Patricia, thank you so much for, for, for making today possible. And um, once again, a thank you to the, to the leaders at the Longy School of Music of Bard College for, for highlighting what you're doing and highlighting why we're doing it together in such a comprehensive way. Ambassador Suazo has stepped out. He had to go across to the, to the General Assembly, but um, so on, on, on his behalf, I'd like to thank you all for attending um, and contributing and taking part. And um, we'll continue to do what we're doing and continuing to make changes in the best way we can. So um, thank you indeed. And uh, visit our websites to, to learn more about the programs we're delivering. So thank you. Um, I wish everyone a great afternoon or evening and um, look forward to the video version of this session online soon. So thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.